Okay, good morning everyone and welcome. I see the attendee numbers are, are increasing as I speak. Welcome to Trialog's first ever virtual CSI forum. We've done these often um, face to face, but this is our virtual, uh, first virtual one. We have close to 300 people registered. So although I know a lot of you who've signed up, I don't know all of you. And I wanted to start with a very brief um, intro to who Trialog is. So my name's Kathy Duff, and I'm one of the directors at Trilog. Um, and Trilog is a business that um, focuses squarely on responsible business. So our vision is really to help organizations to become more sustainable and more responsible and to make social investment more effective. We do this through a number of services. Um, one is our consulting services in the corporate social investment space, and the other is our knowledge sharing platforms. So on consultancy, we help a lot of companies with their corporate social investment strategies and the implementation thereof, and also with the monitoring and evaluation of projects and programs. On the knowledge sharing, we hold a big annual business and society conference. And the reason we're actually having this webinar today is it was due to be the first day of our conference. Uh, the conference has obviously been postponed and we will be holding it on the 13th and 14th of October and do hope to see many of you there. Um, in the interim, we will be having this webinar as well as more to connect and share information. The second knowledge sharing platform there is our Business and Society Handbook. Um, this is an annual publication which is now in its 23rd year and it contains the findings from our primary research into the size and scope of CSI in South Africa, as well as articles and viewpoints um, on, on relevant topics. And the final one on the slide is our Knowledge Hub, which is an online portal of information, and it collates uh, information from various sources on different developmental sectors. And I'd just like to mention that last week, we launched um, a business response to COVID-19 topic on that hub. So there's a lot more information and case studies on the topic we're discussing today on that hub. And also these slides, as well as a recording of the webinar, together with an article that we'll um, put together, will all be put onto the Knowledge Hub. So I'd encourage you to, to visit that. Okay, so the format for today, I'll give an overview uh, of the topic, and this is going to be followed by three case studies. Um, so I think the best way to find out how the pandemic and the lockdown are impacting companies and their social investment and what they're doing in response is to hear directly from them. So we've got Charlene um, Lackey from Momentum Metropolitan, Sana Machaba from Anglo-American Platinum, and Gail Campbell from the Zenix Foundation. Following their introductory overviews, there'll be time for q and A. I'd just like to mention to everybody that the Q&A function is available. If you go to the bottom of your screen, or it might be on the top, uh, there's a Q&A button. We'd encourage you to ask questions throughout the session as they come to you. We will be looking at those and taking questions from there for the Q&A session. Okay, so I'm just gonna start with a kind of framework. There is an article on this on the Knowledge Hub, but a framework in terms of the overall business response to the pandemic. And I think there's obviously many things that companies have done and can be doing and should be thinking about during this time. So the first, and I think what every company's first reaction was about was really the health and safety of employees, as well as the, the continued employment of employees. The second was around honoring payment for contract workers, service providers and suppliers, particularly for small businesses. I think everyone's seen the kind of devastating impact this can have on small businesses and to the extent that it's possible, how can you support those businesses in your supply chain? The third point there is around protecting customers. Obviously, many companies looking not only at the health and safety of cap, uh, customers, but also, also product um, accessibility, and also how to support customers during the financial difficulties that they might be going through. The fourth point is around leveraging core competencies, um, assets and products. And here we've seen many companies step in, whether it's manufacturing, pivoting to masks and ventilators, whether it's financial um, institutions, offering payment or debt um, holidays, whether it's the telco companies providing zero rated uh, connectivity. The next point around what we've called repurposing impacted assets and skills. So many businesses are not operating during this lockdown period. 
and they have dormant or uh, assets that are sitting there, as well as employees that are not currently productive. How, if your business is, is one of the ones that's still operating and has seen heightened demand, how can you um, look at using these assets and skills? A nice example was in the US, Amazon hiring, you know, in the, in the very early weeks, over 150,000 waiters um, to help in their depots and for delivery. The next points around participating in multi-stakeholder responses. Um, I think a, a number of the business associations have put together kind of working groups, dialogue groups that are working with government um, on the response to the pandemic, as well as planning for life after the lockdown. So as far as possible, how can your company participate in those? And then the final point there is around philanthropic contributions, and that's going to be the focus of our session today. So we're going to look broadly at two areas. Firstly, how is the pandemic and the lockdown impacting your existing social investment programs? And secondly, are there any new social investments you should be thinking about given the pandemic? So I'll start with the first of these, and we just um, providing some overview, and then obviously we'll hear more detail in the case study. So I'm just trying to move it down. Um, so the first point, and I think the most important, is to check in, dialogue, and consult with your nonprofit um, and other social investment partners to really understand what's happening to them. So a lot of nonprofits have ceased certain programs, um, you know, particularly I think a lot in the school environment, which is obviously not operating. Um, and others have really ramped up because there's been increased demand, certainly on the nutrition front, on water and sanitation. So how has this impacted your existing partners? How has it impacted their finances, their operations, their programs? And based on this, you can look at making customized responses and solutions with your different partners. So related to that are the next couple of points. The first is around flexible and unrestricted funding. So where your funding was for specific programs or services, can you shift that to make it more flexible so that it can be used to cover overheads or be shifted towards um, COVID-19 specific responses? We have mentioned to try and avoid canceling um, or deferring payments. This is not always possible. We do understand a lot of companies are, are financially strained at this time, but you know, be transparent with your partners um, and to the extent possible, um, shift the funding, make it more flexible and don't defer. Another related point is to adjust the timelines and reporting requirements. Um, obviously the SLAs that were in place are no longer going to be necessarily relevant, particularly if services have halted or adjusted. So look with each of your partners at adjusting those timelines and reporting requirements. The next point is really around supporting advocacy efforts. Are your partners working in communities and advocating for specific responses? Um, and if so, can you, uh, can you support them um, in doing that? The last three points on the slide really speak to what non-financial support can you provide for your existing partners? So the first is, do you have corporate wellness programs that nonprofit management could participate in? These are obviously immensely stressful times. Um, and, you know, both for those nonprofits that have had to stop operations as, as well as for those that have ramped up, um, they may need support and counseling and psychological support could help if you can open your corporate wellness programs. The next is around pro bono services. So you may already be offering some of these, but um, are there some of your employees that can assist nonprofits through this period through providing, for example, either legal help with renegotiating contracts and rental agreements, financial help with building cash flow models, um, uh, marketing and fundraising help? You know, how can your staff help the nonprofits? And the last on this is related to that. Um, is it possible for some of your employees to provide uh, virtual business mentorship to nonprofit management. So those are just some thoughts around how your company can um, support its existing partners. The next slide speaks to how we think you might be thinking about COVID-19 specific responses. So the first um, speaks again to contributing to and participating in national and multi-stakeholder responses. We've obviously seen the Solidarity Fund um, that appeared 
And there's also, as I mentioned, a number of multi-stakeholder dialogues. So how can your company participate in those? We think the second element is key, the second point here, which is to keep whatever new interventions you're doing aligned to your company and to your focus areas. There's obviously so much need nationally at the moment, and, but no one company can be everything to everyone. So we would encourage you to stick to um, your, either your geographic operating areas, um, if you have a big footprint, or whatever your existing social investment focus areas are. Related to that is the next point, which is how can, company, how can you contribute your, um, your products and services? We've seen examples of this, um, you know, some of the car manufacturers uh, providing cars for nonprofits and for emergency response teams. Um, again, the telcos doing that. So looking at how you can use not only your finance, uh, financial resources, but other resources to contribute to the, to the fight. Um, very importantly, the next one is to understand needs on the ground. I mean, obviously things are changing all the time and, uh, you know, CSI practitioners can't be expected to know all of, all of what's going on. So it really speaks to collaborations, potentially new partnerships, or understanding from your existing partners what the needs are and what's happening on the ground. We've um, reiterated on this slide, advocacy or using company voice. Um, not only on policy shifts, uh, but also on for, with other donors to try and encourage other donors to have more flexible responses um, to nonprofits. And then the last point here is really thinking about what happens after lockdown, what happens after the immediate. Um, so planning on contributing to rebuilding the economy uh, in your focus area once the pandemic and the lockdown are over. So to sum up, well, we've just put this visual together, which speaks to three decision points. Uh, the first is resources. How, um, how much resource do you have? Uh, and that's not only financial, but non-financial. And I've mentioned non-financial on both the previous two slides. So, and in many cases, those resources might have actually been reduced. So, but we need to see what resources do we have? Then to look at the type of programs, I've split them between existing programs and new programs. And then to look at timing. So to really think, I think everyone now is in the react phase, the short term phase, you know, adjusting their existing programs, identifying, supporting new programs. But we need to think beyond that also at the phase two, which we've called the adapt phase. So how do we adjust to the new normal? How do we um, adjust our existing programs? Do we need to continue with the new COVID specific programs that we entered? And then phase three, which we've called build, which is the longer term response. So we need to be thinking about our resources, the types of programs and the timing. Okay, so I hope that just provided a framework for this discussion. Um, I'm going to move on now to the case studies. Um, I'd just like to thank our three panelists for participating and agreeing to tell their stories today. And I've asked them each to provide a 10 minute overview of how their social impacts, uh, the, how their social investments have been impacted and what their companies are doing in response. So I'm going to start with Charlene from Momentum Metropolitan. Okay, you've unmuted me, great. Yes. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for the invitation. I kind of feel like you covered 50% of my, of my case study already because a lot of what you said resonated with me in terms of what, how we responded. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to speak about our experience as a social investor during this time. Claim overhead, my apologies. Um, for context, I'll focus on the response of the Momentum Metropolitan Foundation because as the broader business, there was a lot that the business did and that the business got involved with. But I'll focus on the foundation, which is the vehicle for our corporate social investment work. Um, and where it's relevant, I'll refer to some of those really impactful and well-considered things that the business has done. But let me start by saying that uh, this crisis for us laid bare how urgently we need to rethink how we exist in this world as uh, social investors, where there is uh, so much volatility, there's so much uncertainty in the world, and the impact is felt globally, as we've seen with uh, this pandemic. And the reason we need to rethink is because it is very possible that this will not be the last crisis of its kind. So that's something that we 
that that penny dropped very quickly to understand that however we respond now, we're probably setting a bit of a precedent for how we will respond in the future um, as, as a social investor, as a foundation. So there we were on the 15th of March when government announced that schools will close and we knew we were not ready for uh, the impact that it would have on the development sector, on our partners um, and on our collective efforts. Because up until that point, our disaster policy was very much focused on uh, localized volunteer response. In other words, we'd look at, do we have an office in that area where the need is occurring? And uh, would it be possible for us to very rapidly deploy a volunteer corps to assist with relief efforts? We also tended to look at whether there was something more and more enduring beyond the crisis that we could do is in the aftermath of the disaster. So just as an example, if you can recall, if you're from Cape Town um, or you love Cape Town and follow what is happening there, you would know that the Cape Town fires in mountains or on mountains and in informal settlements are an annual occurrence. Uh, so this is something that the business was faced with on an annual basis because at the time the Momentum brand was um, the sponsor for a number of years of the of a cycle um, challenge in, in Cape Town. So it was relevant for the business that uh, we pay attention to this because the two always seem to coincide. Fires, cycle challenge. Um, and what we did there then was to work with local government to say, okay, we can respond now, but let's look at when this is over, what can we do to make sure that there's a decreased impact for the vulnerable when this happens again. So we worked with local government to establish safety training kits and demonstrations that were done by firefighters, make those available to vulnerable communities, to early childhood development centers, and we rolled that out. So the thinking was always, we can respond now, but what can we do that will possibly make this better afterwards? Um, but still, I mean, that was wholly inadequate when, when we were faced with, uh, with the chaos that COVID-19 unleashed because like everybody else, we didn't have a playbook for how to deal with a pandemic that in a very crude way exposed the inequalities in our society. Um, and and if, if you were oblivious for some reason to that, now you couldn't ignore it. So to come back to the one question that I want to address that was posed to me, um, to focus this talk around how did we manage to, if we didn't have a playbook, how did we manage to respond then so quickly? Again, just for context, our social investment strategy runs on the three legs. So we have our youth employment programs um, where we work with MPO partners to support young people on their journey to employment. We've also got financial literacy focused mostly on high school learners. And then I don't, I, I assume that there are some international um, listeners or attendees of this webinars for their benefit, TVET colleges, which are technical and vocational training colleges, because it is important to us that if we are going to make an investment in helping young people to achieve, achieve a sustainable income, then you know, you've got to protect that investment, but it's also part of protecting their future. And then the third leg of our social investment work is our volunteer work, where we place a very high premium on skills-based volunteerism uh, and transferring knowledge to non-profits because we believe that makes them stronger and it can make them more resilient and it can outlast in many um, regards your financial contribution. So these three streams were disrupted quite severely. Um, the announcement came on the 15th on the Monday, the 16th, we immediately went into uh, almost like a crisis mode as the CSI team. Um, we started an immediate assessment of how specifically our six youth employment partners were going to be affected. Because although they are non-profits, uh, because they focus on skills training, they follow the lead of higher education institutions. And it was obvious for us that after the school closures would come the university closures and then the colleges would follow and our nonprofit partners engaging in skills training would follow that lead. So campuses would close 
And if we bear in mind that these nonprofits serve youth that are already at risk in vulnerable communities. So we knew that there was going to be a problem there. By the way, uh, Kathy, I noted you said adjusted in the framework, adjusting your, um, maybe your, your funding principles. And for us, the, um, the interesting thing at, was that at that point in time on the 16th of March, most of the funding to our nonprofit partners had already been dispersed. So we essentially, um, you know, we were done. But we knew that if we wanted to do something, and we did, that we would have to be um, pretty creative about it. And also, uh, for us as a financial services company in South Africa, uh, besides our youth employment programs now being affected because of campuses closing, for our financial literacy programs, um, which are very heavily legislated, they need to be done in a certain way, need to be done um, within a certain time frame, measurement period. Um, we knew that there was going to be an issue for us uh, because the execution of those program speaks to your broad-based Black Economic Empowerment score. Just again, for the benefit of, of um, the non-South African listeners. Basically, that assesses the extent to which your business has contributed to the transformation of society, and that in turn influences your ability to, to do business. And we were only 60% through the implementation of our financial education programs. So again, red flag, we knew that there was going um, to be a problem for us. So we made a few decisions very quickly within that week, um, which some people might view as being extremely pessimistic, but in this sense, I think it stood us in great stead. It, it benefited us when some people were maybe still having taking the approach of let's wait and see. We were already thinking and planning for um, the worst case scenario. Just as an aside, I think that's probably the other thing that uh, um, this crisis revealed for us that just as CSI teams, we need to be a lot more cognizant of identifying and managing risk. Um, so to understand what could possibly go wrong and how do we plan for it, that the world is not always going to be perfect and normal. We're going to contribute funding and then we're going to make an impact. There are going to be other things beyond our control and how do we respond from a position where you essentially feel kind of powerless. Um, so we, the few decisions that we made was immediately to suspend all volunteer events, at least till June. Remember, this was still before lockdown. So um, it was kind of, why spending it to June? But being also in an organization that has the benefit of experts in the medical and the health field, we knew that probably what this, um, what this development of this virus was going to look like, that this was not going to be um, just um, just um, a quick turnaround and moving into normalcy very quickly, but that we were very potentially in this for the long haul and we had to plan with that in mind. Um, for our financial literacy programs, particularly the ones that are in schools we, and that were either not implemented or that were not completed, those were immediately shifted to the third quarter, suspended all stakeholder engagement, suspended all site visits, we pulled our service providers um, from, from the financial literacy implementation programs. And uh, we also immediately engaged with our stakeholders. In particular, the uh, Financial Sector Transformation Council of South Africa. So the regulator that had to look at how are we doing financial education and the people that were measuring us on that, and also a CISA, which is an industry body that we belong to. So this was all in the first week. But then we also realized that we very quickly had to put together a framework for how we're going to respond to this crisis quickly because there were so many levels on which you could make a contribution. Immediately there was uh, um, needs that were laid bare. Are you going to do things that are going to be directed at advocacy work? 
um, at awareness campaigns, at sharing information, at advocating for physical distancing? Um, or are you going to respond to the immediate need of organizations who suddenly don't have an influx of volunteers assisting with relief work now? Um, what is it that you what is it that you were going to do the school feeding schemes that were suddenly going to be um in jeopardy so where would you go where were you going to insert yourselves and we knew that we had to develop a framework very quickly so we started consultations first with our partners our npr partners <clears throat> and it was a very um with with a few of them it was a it was almost like a strange conversation because even they themselves had not thought of what it is that they need to do. Um, and we were saying, but we need to start thinking about this. What, it, what is it that you are going to need to navigate this crisis? Um, and, and, and that took some time and that took some discussion to understand what are their needs on, on the ground. Uh, we discussed with our partners, but also broader, we consulted with um, with other organizations, consulted with UNICEF to understand what it is that they are doing, uh, the Red Cross of South Africa, um, we did connect to Gift of the Givers from a CSI perspective um, to understand where they were going to focus their efforts. And all of that together, uh, I can't share my screen now, but all of that together brought us to uh, this framework where we said that the from experts, we understand that the most important thing we can do is to advocate for physical distancing. The most important thing we can do is to enable the spread of credible scientific information that are going to help people understand why it is important that they need to behave in a new way. If it is a new way for them, that they need to understand why they need to behave in a new way. But that in advocating for that, there are going to be certain fallouts that we need to take cognizance of. So the three main buckets that we um, saw were, let me just do this so that I can get it right. The three buckets that we saw were that they were going to be needs in terms of nutrition and food security. Then they were going to be health care and physical safety and also the fallout in terms of social support and motivation so to explain and expand a little bit on the on this Charlene, yeah can I just come in um can i yeah. stop you there i mean that was great and certainly it's momentum metropolitan was the first company that i saw respond and your your overview here has has told us how early you were thinking about this and how early you mm. you halted your programs and things we can perhaps go into more detail on those three buckets in the q a I just want to mm. get the overviews um, from the other two panelists, and then we've okay. already got quite a number of questions coming through. So I'm going to come back okay. to you after that. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, Charlene. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Sana Machaba, who's the Head of Social Performance at Anglo-American Platinum. I'm just unmuting you there, Sana, um, to give an overview of how your company has responded. Thanks. Um, uh, thanks, Cathy. And, um, Good morning, colleagues that you might be viewing from all over the world, or all over the country. And this is indeed a difficult time for all of us. And I think it's uh, like Shalene has said, it's something that we had not prepared for. Um, as Anglo-American, um, we operate mainly in the Limpopo and Northwest province of South Africa. We also have an operation, uh, Unki Mine in Zimbabwe. But as you are aware, Anglo-American has presence in um, most countries globally, from South America to Australia. And we are fortunate that we obviously have to learn from not only how we're dealing with this in South Africa, but obviously from our sister operations that are based in other parts of the world. Just to share a bit on the um, Anglo-American Platinum um, social performance or CSI strategy, um, our focus has always been around um, education, health and welfare, supply of water to communities, um, 
community infrastructure in, in general, which ranges from road constructions to um, uh, providing um, street lights and electrification of houses in the communities where we are operating. And um, how we're doing that, it has always been based on a framework that we call the Anglo-American Social Way, um, which from, you know, starts with the risk identification um, and, and, and obviously looking at the impact that we would have as mining operations to our communities and how we will respond to that. So the area of risk and, you know, risk with social consequences has always been something that we thought um, we were on top of because we've got programs that from the beginning of the year, we know which risks we have identified, how we are going to manage them, and we've got plans that, that are in place to mitigate those and, um, um, and, and, and respond accordingly. Um, and in addition, you would be aware that we also do what we call the social and neighbor plans that are five-year plans that direct what we do and our contribution into, into the communities. And like I've indicated, our programs are including, include areas like infrastructure, where you're constructing a road or you're electrifying homes. So obviously with the um, COVID-19 that, 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 that came upon us, there was no way that we could be in a position to continue with um, a, a initiatives like that. So the majority of our um, CSI programs that you, as you call them, or our SLP projects had to be brought to a halt. And I must say, Kathy, that that immediately, you know, give an indication that because the majority of the jobs that these programs bring, you can already putting a program like that on hold, you can already see the impact that it will have in communities. And unfortunately, in our case, we operate in rural communities where there isn't many um, you know, opportunities that, that people could look at. But if you've got just that program, is the only program that's running and that's what's creating opportunities for, for the local communities. So um, education, we have um, about a, you know, 12,000 learners that are participating in our education programs. That obviously, um, given the fact that we are in the, in the rural communities, the connectivity is not, I mean, we talk about, um, you know, visual connection, we're talking about online programs that, that learners could access. But when you're operating in rural community, it presents a different dynamic where there isn't any other way of presenting the case um, or presenting your programs. So those are some of the things that you know, came as an impact of, of, of the COVID. So obviously when we um, then started with, um, uh, you know, when the lockdown was announced as a company, we were given um, exemptions, if we were to call them, where some of our operations could uh, be scaled down um, to still operate um, at, at, at um, below 50% of the labor force coming to work. But our underground operations, which obviously would employ uh, more people, were then put on what we call can maintenance. So we couldn't bring people on, 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 uh, uh, at work but obviously make sure that those that are, um, are coming in are only the, on standby and making sure that they, you know, they, 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 we provide can maintenance to our operations. Now that in itself brought a dynamic where you are still somehow operational. Uh, your employees are interacting with communities, are commuting to work on a daily basis. And therefore, you need to respond in such a way that you continue to put programs or initiatives that would prevent the infections. Now, we started then putting together our um, community response plans. 
And our community response plans were then focused in three areas. The first area was the area around prevention. How do we continue to prevent the spread of the pandemic in our operations? But obviously, because we source labor from within the communities, with, there was no way that we could not um, you know, look at how the very initiatives that we are implementing within our gates are then extended outside the communities because you can't separate the mine from the community where they are operating. So our prevention initiatives um, obviously started by looking at how within our pro the profile of the employees that are working, we identify those that are vulnerable. Vulnerable ones that then they will not be brought on to the sites, so it's done responsibly and making sure that the profile of the employees is done and make sure that whoever comes in is not, you know, people that are living with HIV and AIDS, people that have got cases of TBs, people that are above, you know, the age of 50 or so, those are the, the people that we classified as vulnerable and obviously were not called in to come to work and it was done responsibly. But obviously the screening um, of making sure that anyone that then comes on site is thoroughly screened and we know exactly where they are and um, they can be assisted um, where you know, the, 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 the support is required. We then have um, made sure that at all our sites we've got extensive or thorough hygiene and, 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 and training that is provided and sanitizing that is happening and to make sure that the employees when they do come on site they are they still feel that you know they are protected obviously the issue you touched on it kathy in your overview that continued payment of employees was critical that even those that are not coming to work um, they don't feel that you know when you come to, when you don't come to work then you will not be paid. You will not be paid. So obviously we continued the paying of, of 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 salaries, but with a special bonus for for those that are coming during this this lockdown period. And obviously the focus on making sure that there is necessary PPE and material that people would use when they are on site. Now I'm not that much qualified to talk about what happens internally because my focus is obviously um, externally within the community. So within the community, we also moved to the, to the next um, phase of our, of our community response plan, which talks about responding. How do we respond and support government and our communities in as far as um, this pandemic is concerned? I've already mentioned the issues around as being in, in rural communities where, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, the prevention measures, you talk about washing of hands. And the reality is that we still have villages in our communities that do not have access to water. Um, so, and as much as the supply of water has been one of the focus areas, and we have um, over the past three years been um, ramping up on working with the municipality to supply water within our communities. We last year just, um, you know, managed to deliver water to over 80,000 people around the Mahalakwana mine where we are operating. But obviously we have not reached all the villages that are there. Um, so the expansion of our water programs in the municipalities was one of the main programs that we had to focus on to make sure that when we talk about washing of hands, yes, people do have, do have um, um, water. So obviously doing initiatives like that, it means a, a, a robust stakeholder engagement. You are not going to rock up in a village and just start drilling boreholes. And obviously water a, 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 a provision is still the competency of the municipalities. So we're working very closely with the municipalities where we are operating and we managed to continue to participate in the, um, what they call the command centers that have been established by government in most areas. We would go there and participate and make sure that we engage. And obviously the people that are tasked to do that work are trained they are provided with um, the necessary PPE to make sure that we still continue on the quest to, pre to prevent the infections. So um, water has been one of the programs that we, we are focusing on. 
not only in South Africa, like I said, but also in Zim, where we continue to uh, drill boreholes and equip them and pipe the water closer to communities to make sure that obviously when people are fetching water, there isn't, um, the, you know, the rules around uh, social isolation, it's still, it's still observed. Um, then the biggest one as well is around the small businesses. How do we continue to support small businesses? Even those that were, I mean, we had contracts, we we're building schools, we we're building roads, we we're building, um, a, you know, a, a water a, 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 um, infrastructure in our communities. And some of those obviously had to be put on hold. How do we continue to support the small businesses? And um, some people might be aware that we, within Anglo, we have what we called Anglo Zimena, which is the funding wing of the company. And most of these uh, suppliers and, and um, uh, small businesses within our communities are supported by Anglo Zimela. So obviously we had to um, also consider how we support the small businesses during this time by continuing to pay you know, the contracts, um, but also giving them um, a break uh, in terms of repayments for the loans that they would be having with our funding um, wing, which is Anglo Zemele. Now, um, in addition, we also looked at how we um, address the vulnerabilities within the, 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 the communities. And food security is one of those where we've got the majority of people. I mean, if you talk about areas like Sikukuni where we are operating, you've got more than 50% unemployment already. So obviously this brings uh, even complex dynamics where mines are shut down, people are not working, contractors are on hold. Um, so obviously the support around food parcels was also one of the things that we are currently looking at. And on these initiatives, we work very closely with the municipalities where we are operating, but also with the Department of Social Development, because they've got um, already uh, their own um, lists of uh, vulnerable um, uh, members of the communities that we will obviously focus on. So we didn't have to go and start identifying, but we were able to then add to the list of the Department of Social Development um, and, and the municipalities in our communities. And obviously we partnered with Gift of the Givers in terms of um, you know, the distribution of food parcels in these communities and making sure that um, you know, the vulnerables in some way have some relief. But I think as we go and implement all these things, what remains important is the messaging and the campaigns and the awareness around the pandemic in rural areas. The reality is um, majority of people in rural areas still think that it is a Gauteng and Western Cape uh, thing. They are not, they are not, they, they haven't seen the impact as much. And it is therefore, critical that we continue to work with the Department of Health in making sure that we send those messages to our communities and making sure that, um, you know, we communicate as much as we can around um, or assuring even the families of our employees that in as much as they come to work, these are the measures that we are putting in place, is not that we are not observing the lockdown rules. Thank now you, the big I'm going to I'm going to come in there um just so we give uh, Gail a chance and we've got some time for okay. questions but thanks for that overview I think um both you and Charlene have stressed the importance of the role of business in actually just communicating uh, the right information and credible information um for prevention purposes Okay, I'm going to hand over to Gail Campbell, who is the CEO of the Zenex Foundation. Their um, investments are focused in the education space. So um, we're going to hear from Gail how these have been impacted and how they're thinking about adjusting. Thanks, Gail. Um, thanks, uh, Kathy, and um, morning to all the colleagues. Um, I thought I could uh, cover four areas, just um, talking about Xenex as a funder and um, where our funding is and how that's been impacted. Um, looking at our involvement in multi-stakeholder um, 
initiatives. A second part, so it's relatively um, phases in our response to date, and then just looking at some pointers for our strategy going forward. Now, Xenix, um, as an organization, is an independent um, funder. It's private. We have a fixed endowment. In, in, in that sense, we have an original endowment and it grows through the way we manage our investments. In other words, we don't have a continuous flow of money coming into that endowment from any corporate or from any um, individual donor. So it's a fixed amount that started and it grows through investments. Um, when we looked in the first week, um, of um, the COVID-19 lockdown, we had lost about 2% of the value of endowment. And our investment house was saying that overall, um, if they're looking at other funds, there's a loss of about 10% already. Fortunately, our investment house had started looking at um, the profile of our investments when already we saw signs of the pandemic in, in, in China. So from the point of view of I, at this stage, I want to say we not we haven't had huge losses as compared to other um, funds. However, the real impact we'll only see um, um, moving forward. The second is our multi-stakeholder involvement, and that for me has been critical, because one thing that we've learned in an area, in a time of uncertainty and anxiety, we couldn't act on our own. And I want to talk about this at three levels, at the level of funders, at the level of the NPO community, and then government. In, at the level of the NPO community, Xenix has been very involved with NASCI, and that's the Association of Education NPOs. And in talking to um, the NPO community, if you work in education, I would urge you to be part of that community because you're part of understanding and learning together and looking how you can align and coordinate. At the level of funders, um, we've been involved in initiatives internationally and locally. And um, first donors were meeting and um, IPASA, the Philanthropy Association was um, the main convener, and the first round looked at humanitarian aid around health aid, and now there's a specific group looking at how can we coordinate around education initiatives. At the level of government, um, Xenix first just kept in touch with some of our individual contacts um, to understand where education was. But the importance of now engaging at a multi-stakeholder level, NASCI has got a formal engagement with government now on Wednesday, and we're looking to do the same thing for funders. Because I think in engaging with government, and I'm just looking at education, it's very difficult for government to respond to individual funders. And that's why I'm uh, very much in favor of working in the, with these um, collective um, sort of stakeholder groups in the, with the NPO community and with the NGO community. Xenix's response. Um, part one, I think it was a little bit of a naive response. In the first week, we sent a letter to all our partners to say we'll continue paying tranches. And then we looked at that letter and said, well, it's not telling our partners very much. So you'll get the money, but we're not giving any guidance in terms of how to, to use it. And in that sense, we then started doing investigation around what some of the international donors were doing and what some of our uh, local donors were doing. And we went to our partners, that's 30 of them, and did a quick round of research. And we found that 
all work in schools had been halted because obviously schools closed already from the, the 16th. That's the level of interventions and any research and m and &E in schools. Where organizations were involved in research and m and &E, they could still do desktop work and if they were uh, writing reports, they could do that. Where projects were involved in materials development, they could work virtually. And where organizations were doing thought pieces, writing up um, for knowledge sharing, that work was, was going on. So we sort of saw a clear distinction between what was what you could and couldn't do at the level of schools and then what you could do working uh, virtually and at the end of that first round we went to our board and we sort of looked at two levels how we're going to treat our existing grants and then what new work we were going to do in relation to COVID, similar to what you were talking about kathy um, and then we went to round two, um, which we're currently in, and we're really focusing now on understanding um, in more depth what we can do on our current projects and putting a budget to that. So at the end of this, we'll know organization by organization what parts of the current grant can be used on, on, on projects. And in doing the second round of research, it's not one size fits all. Projects are different, organizations are different, the size of grants uh, um, differ, and we're finding that we need a case-by-case -case, um, response, and that we take into our board on, on the 7th of May. Now moving to phase three, which we're in, is then saying, from our existing grants, that amount that's not going to be used on current projects, how can we use that to respond to COVID-19 with our current partners? And then what new money are we going to invest in for um, COVID-19 um, responses? And more, we've more or less made a distinction between money that has been already committed between, uh, for 2020 and new f funding, the, uh, new money that was in our budget um, that we s feel is not going to be used for um, new projects as planned, but directed towards um, COVID-19. Um, just in terms of how we see in the response in terms of COVID-19 in education. And we've looked at two areas. The one is what can you do with learners who are at home? And if you look at the DBE's current plan, learners will be at home different phases right up until um, early July. And then how can we support the DBE in what happens in school? And it's two different areas and different kinds of strategies that you need. Because at home, it's about supplementary work and um, not formal delivery of the curriculum. At school, it's about supporting the DBE on the recovery plan. And that's where I say that's moving into phase three, where we can look more directly at how we're going to support education um, with regard to its impact on education. Our own strategy now moving forward, we've had to look at how our organization is going to operate. Um, and it's an unknown, uncertain, and these things um, change um, so constantly. And we've taken the view that um, if the lockdown ends at the end of April, it's still not going to be business as, as usual. And we're still planning for our organization to work virtually, and we've put a peg in the ground up until July. Um, where it comes to um, schooling and our program with regard to interventions at, at school, as I've said, it's a two-part approach. One is, 
what can we do on our existing projects where we've, we, where we've got contracts? And then secondly, how can we support um, education with the COVID-19 response? And there we've taken the view that it should support the recovery plan of the DBE because that's going to be the focus at least for 2020. I can't see that the education department is going to be open to um, projects around testing new ideas or innovations. It's going to be all hands on deck um, with regard to the recovery plan. And we're just looking at 2020 now. Um, I think as the year progresses, um, we'll start beginning to think about um, how the impact flows into 2021 and 22 for schooling. So in summary, just focused on Xenix and our funding base, really stressing the need to get involved um, with forums for MPOs and, and, and donors. Third, looking at the response and, and learning from others with that and knowing that you're going to make mistakes along, along the way. And fourth, looking at our strategy, but taking at this point, a medium term approach that just looks at 2020. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you, Gail. Um, and thanks again to, to the three panelists for agreeing to speak. Um, Gail, thanks for reiterating the importance of um, those multi stakeholder dialogues and the collaboration. Um, I don't think uh, any one company or funder can, can think about um, addressing this without that. Uh, we've had lots of questions coming in and we've got five <laughs> minutes left, so uh, we're not going to be able to address them all. Um, I, we will try to get back to the people if we haven't touched on your questions. Uh, I would just like to ask each panelist to give a closing and in that to touch on some of the questions. So um, Charlene, if, if you would start and just impact, there was a, a couple of questions specifically for you, but if you could just say what those three buckets were and also say, how is your CSI strategy going to be influenced going forward? I'll start with the difficult answer, Kathy. Uh, how is our CSI strategy going to be impacted? We don't know, but that it will be impacted. It was one realization from all of this is that we need to be open to experimenting quickly, fail quickly, pivot, make new decisions, and just be flexible about that. It is trying to, to make sense of, of the chaos with the tools that we have and that we are developing daily. But that the strategy will be impacted, definitely. Um, we might look at, you know, because the one thing that Gail mentioned, which is very important, is looking post COVID-19. The economy is going to be need rebuilding. Our schooling system is going to need a lot of support, um, especially if we look at where we focus on youth unemployment. We cannot afford to have a bottleneck with 70% or a whole lot of grade 12s, for example, not matriculating, not writing the exams or students dropping out of school. That would exacerbate the problem that we are trying to address. Um, so we are, we are already shifting our minds to what happens next. Um, how will we redirect our funding? Um, also, how will we manage our resources maybe differently? Because as a foundation, you would know that there are a lot of regulations that uh, prohibit us from uh, having too much money in the bank, to put it plainly. But how do we maybe um, apply a, a solid and a resilient uh, investment strategy to those resources so that when we have a COVID-19 or similar, we are able to make use of that and access that very quickly so that we can respond and that we can just be more nimble. The three buckets, um, sorry, I didn't get to that now, the three buckets around nutrition and food security, we knew that they would be, that would be an increased area of vulnerability, healthcare and physical safety, because yes, the issue of gender-based violence comes up and the issue of children are increasingly being at risk. Um, in terms of healthcare safety, because a lot of our NPOs deal with um, organize and deal with communities where uh, they present healthcare services um, that support people with HIV AIDS. So how, how are we going to manage them and support them with that? 
And then social support, uh, you cannot have a youth at risk being disengaged for months. Um, what what you do to keep them engaged and, and keep them motivated? Um, and what are the kinds of technologies that you will use to make sure that you do that? Thank you, Charlene. Um, Sana, I'm going to hand over to you next and ask you just in your closing, if you can touch on, um, we've had a question around how do you think the COVID-19 pandemic will impact the SD G agenda um, and, and then if you can also touch on if, if you've thought about your strategy going forward. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Cathy. Um, so the last part that I didn't um, get to touch on in, in, in my overview was the fact that we, a, a part of our plan also talks about recovery. Um, the recovery phase, which means post uh, lockdown, but obviously, uh, how do we then take um, the learnings from what we were doing or what we had to do now in response to the COVID, but then integrate that into our strategies going forward on how or how is it then going to, to reshape our SED strategy or our community development strategy. So I think the, the um, as I indicated that we've got the framework that we use around the Anglo-Social and the programs that we have already been focusing on has been around water, around health and, 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 and the health infrastructure, around um, education. And I think here we are given an opportunity to then look at, you know, we were given the opportunity to identify the gaps. We were always able to give education in a particular way and obviously we cannot continue to, you know, to give our education programs in a way that we used to do. Fortunately, before the pandemic last year, we had already looked at, um, done an extensive baseline around health um, and healthcare within our communities. And we will obviously have to look at how we incorporating what we had already planned and obviously making sure that the learnings from this process are then incorporated into uh, the programs that we had already. We, um, you know, in terms of funding, obviously we had the opportunity not to um, touch on our committed SLP funds, but obviously had the opportunity to, uh, to be funded by the Anglo-American Foundation. And obviously the learnings, like I said, from other countries, um, um, we will obviously have to share. We continue to share. We're having calls almost every day to share with our colleagues from all parts of the world on how they are responding and, and, and how do we continue to improve. So basically, it's an issue of continuous improvement and making sure that the learnings um, are not missed in, 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 in you know, this area that we have been in. Thank you, Sana. And thank you for raising that, the continuous learning um, and the sharing of info. I think it's so vital and great, you know, that you're doing that across the Anglo family. And I'm hoping that we can coordinate more of that um, across sectors and across companies. So, Gail, last word to you. And um, you've already spoken about your strategy in terms of 2020 and how you're thinking about um, the future. But maybe we've got quite a few nonprofits and social enterprises on the call. Um, if, who are asking about funding and how that's going to change. Um, if you have any advice or thoughts uh, for them in, in your closing, please. Um, uh, Cathy, that's a difficult one around. Um, so let me just speak about um, the trends I'm seeing um, in, 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 in the Downer Forum. Um, there's definitely that distinction you drew at the beginning in terms of how do you work with your existing partners where you already have contacts <coughs> in place in relation to the project that was funded and how you could repurpose those grants into COVID-19 support activities. That's the one side. The second side is um, some foundations, um, be they private or corporate, have already indicated that they're making new money available for to extend um, their reach um, and uh, look at new projects and new partners. Um, and I think there's already been a discussion amongst donors that yes, but you need to look at 
what you're going to fund mm -hmm. and how you're going to fund. And that's an area that everyone's grappling with. Um, do you put out calls broadly? Um, do you go back to your existing partners and say, come up with new ideas? We've got some new funding. Um, do you support something like NET, where there's a, um, a already um, a, a, a way of trying to coordinate what, what, what donors um, are doing? Or do you go directly and work with governments and, and look at where you can, can intervene? So I actually don't have a, an answer. All I can point to some of the issues that... Um, I see funders grappling with. And that's why I'm stressing the need to join these forums because you can be part of the debate and the answer. Just one final thing, there was no appetite amongst funders to set up an education fund. It's like the Solidarity Fund has been set up or the SAFT Fund has been set up for S SMMEs um, around, just around the bureaucracy and the governance that that would take. So definitely that's one direction I, ca uh, I can say moving forward with regard to how funding is going to happen. Thanks. Thank you, Gail. Um, I think, as you said, is a, it's a moving target. Um, and just, I mean, we're aware of a couple of funds, like I know CAF South Africa has set up an emergency fund for nonprofits. But I would encourage you to continue to visit our Knowledge Hub, where we will be uploading resources um, it is all the people in the, in the right direction. Okay, so um, uh, on that note, I'm going to close this. We've run a few minutes over. Uh, thank you for our first uh, trial webinar. Thanks so much to our panelists. Thanks to all the participants. I know I didn't get to all the answers. We will try to get back to you. We have um, saved those questions. And yes, we'll be putting the presentation, the recording and the article up on our Knowledge Hub portal. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you.